Hey guys, um, so let's talk about myasthenia gravis. So this is one of the autoimmune disorders that you're gonna need to know for this semester. And you know, the really important thing as you're kind of looking at these is kind of differentiating, you know, what is the problem? And almost all of these have something to do with muscle weakness. It's just where is the muscle weakness or what does it look like? How are we gonna diagnose it? And what are those treatments? And a lot of those treatments are gonna look the same, but I really wanna just kind of be looking at kind of some of those subtle differences between all of these. So uh, myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disorder that attacks acetylcholine receptors. So in other words, um, you know, it's starting to break down acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is needed for a lot of your muscle activity. Um, and specifically for myasthenia gravis, it causes muscle weakness within the face. So, um, you know, what's really common is the ptosis, which is that drooping eyelid. Um, the pattern you might notice with this weakness is that it's worse later in the day, or in other words, as you're doing activity, Activity throughout the day, it's getting worse. They also can progress to the point where they have difficulties with their swallowing and their speech. So it can also affect the muscles in their jaw, in their mouth. Um, so obviously you can see where that would cause a lot of um, impairment and difficulty. So what's the worst that could happen? There's what's called a myasthenic crisis. And this is an acute worsening of myasthenia gravis. They're already having this ptosis, like this weakness. Um, you know, this is like where we get to that extreme where there's like respiratory depression, difficulty breathing, aspiration, all those respiratory complications. So when you think what's the worst that can happen with myasthenia gravis, think respiratory complications. Um, and usually um, this kind of crisis is triggered by stress. Anything autoimmune, we wanna avoid stress at all possible possibilities. So you're going to kind of see that pattern for a lot of these. Um, but we want to avoid things like infection, emotional distress, and things like that. So the diagnosis for myasthenia gravis, and you're going to see this kind of for a lot of the autoimmune, is that it's going to be mostly made by symptoms and history. We can do an EMG, which looks at muscle activity and kind of see like that muscle weakness that may be present in their face. But one of the other tests that we um, use is what's called a Tensilon test. Now this one, students get really confused by this. So let me see if I can break it down for you. Effect, effectively, what Tensilon is, is a medication that blocks the breakdown of acetylcholine. So let me, um, let me me back up a little bit. You know, remember for uh, myasthenia gravis, the problem is um, acetylcholine is being broken down. So what Tensilon does is it stops that breakdown. So in other words, it's not blocking acetylcholine, it's blocking the blocking of acetylcholine. So in other words, it's blocking what is breaking down acetylcholine. So in other words, it helps so you're not breaking down so much. So this is what I want in myasthenia gravis. So if I have myasthenia gravis and I get Tensilon, you're gonna see an immediate improvement in muscle weakness. Like they're gonna get that strength back because what the problem is, is that acetylcholine is being broken down. If you give them a medicine, to block that um, from happening, then it's usually a sign that it's myasthenia gravis. However, um, there's something called cholinergic crisis. And we're gonna, I'm gonna show you the table that's in your book. And this is one of the, probably the more confusing things about this. Um, cholinergic crisis, which is the opposite, which is that I have too much acetylcholine looks a lot like if I have not enough acetylcholine. So, you know, um, if I give the Tensilon to a patient that has myasthenia gravis, they get better. But if I give the Tensilon, which remember, creates you to have more acetylcholine and I'm already have too much because I'm in cholinergic crisis, it'll get worse. So, you know, um, if I do this test, I always have to have atropine at the bedside, which is an anticholinergic, um, which is going to help because if I get too much choline and if they're actually in crisis, like a cholinergic crisis, um, then it can be a real problem. So I really want to differentiate these. I'm not talking about a myasthenic crisis. I'm talking about a cholinergic crisis. So look at it this way. With acetylcholine, you can have too much or not enough. Myasthenia gravis is not enough. Cholinergic crisis is too much. Um, and then what happens is if I give Tensilon, um, that's going to cause me to have more acetylcholine or stop it from being broken down. So myasthenia gravis, I don't have enough. I need more. So this helps me. But if I'm in cholinergic crisis and I already have too much and then I give even more, that's going to worsen that crisis. So um, I'll show you the um, table on the next um, page. But just keep in mind, you know, they also differentiate here. There's a, myasthenic, there's a myasthenic crisis where I have a crisis of not enough acetylcholine. And then there's also a cholinergic crisis, which is a crisis where I have too much of the acetylcholine. So just kind of, you know, there's those three words, myasthenic crisis, myasthenia gravis, 
a cholinergic crisis. So um, just kind of differentiate those. And I definitely recommend writing those out so you don't get them confused. So what medications can I give? So obviously my problem is, is that I'm breaking down acetylcholine. I need to stop breaking it down. So we can um, do anticholinesterase drugs. And that might seem like that, that, that word doesn't make sense, but keep in mind anticholinesterase agents, what they're doing is they're stopping again, the breakdown of the acetylcholine. And they do these more over time so that you're not those antibodies and their antigens that are fighting your acetylcholine receptor, stop doing that. Um, so it really helps to prevent you from having those attacks. Um, we can also suppress the immune system with steroids or immunosuppressive agents. Um, and there's also removing the thymus. So the thymus is responsible for creating a lot of those antibodies that are going and breaking down acetylcholine. So by removing the thymus, you're removing the thing that's sometimes stimulating. And again, it's not always the thymus, but sometimes that is a helpful procedure to do. So what's our overall management of this? So I have three main priorities and that's gonna be adequate airway clearance or preventing aspiration. I also wanna make sure they have adequate muscle strength and functional capacity. Uh, capacity um, and then preventing complications. So I'm really going to be worried about, you know, them being able to protect their airway, um, not have those respiratory complications, um, and then have, you know, general functional ability to be able to do their day-to-day -day activities with, uh, with minimal loss of functioning. So what can I teach them? Again, you know, this is something that the more that you do during the day, the worse it's going to get. So energy conservation techniques are key. Um, they need to know signs and symptoms of a crisis, the respiratory distress, difficulty swallowing, um, a balanced diet, um, especially because they have that muscle weakness. And, um, you know, again, if they're using those muscles because they're like chewing on some really hard to chew foods or hard to swallow foods, it's going to wear their muscles out. So um, eating foods that are easily chewed or swallowed is going to be really helpful for them. And this is not saying a liquid diet, but this is saying just easy to chew and, um, you know, swallow foods. Um, and then um, schedule medications um, to be most effective during mealtime. So in other words, I want to take them that the peak of that medicine is going to take place during their meals. That way that they have that extra because during meals, that's when they're going to need to use the most of their muscles. So if I can schedule medications to be taken during that, not they're not taking the medications with their meals, but they're scheduling the peak of those medications to be during mealtime. That way that strength that they're getting from their medication can help them through that time where they're going to need more strength. And then, you know, this is a, um, what do you call it, a, a table in your book. And this kind of, remember, there's myasthenia gravis, which just means I'm breaking down too much acetylcholine. Then there's myasthenic crisis, which means I'm in crisis and I'm having those respiratory complications um, from my myasthenia gravis. And then there's the opposite, which is cholinergic crisis, which means I have had too much um, acetylcholine now. I have too much on that end. So these can look alike. And the thing that hap can happen that you, this is why you have to be careful is that think of it, uh, think of it this way, why this is, um, we need to look at both of these. Um, if I have myasthenia gravis and we've established that's what I have, they put me on medications so that I stop breaking down acetylcholine. So I have more acetylcholine. The problem is, is I can always go too far on the end of that spectrum. So I'm taking my medicine, I'm thinking it's helping, but I get too much. That's where I can go into cholinergic crisis. So, um, you know, teaching patients kind of some of these differences between them, um, what's going to make them better or worse. And again, you know, sometimes doing that Tensilon test was what we have to do to differentiate um, what's going on. Um, um, and, um, you know, really just protecting the patient's safety because at the end of the day for both of these, you can see they have weakness and um, they can have respiratory difficulties. And I really have to watch it closely to be able to make sure I keep that patient safe. So um, hopefully that makes sense. I know it's a lot, but that is just one of the five um, we call uh, autoimmune diseases that you have to know about. So hopefully this helped. I'll see you for the next video.